All right, and I'm gonna have to minimize myself here so I don't see that. All righty, so plants in the lower Columbia River. Um, and just in terms of an overview, um, well, actually, before I get into my overview, I have to thank two uh, people um, who live down in the lower Columbia region, Columbia River region, and have um, really kind of inspired me and motivated me and hosted me as well um, when I've been down there doing field work. And those two people are Kathy Maxwell, who lives in Nacelle, and Kathleen Sace, who lives in Nakata. And really, um, they are the two most knowledgeable botanists uh, in that region. And there's a lot of diversity there. And so, you know, I've had a chance to go out in the field with both of them on multiple occasions. And I've learned a lot from being out in the field with them and have also, of course, enjoyed their company. And uh, the person to the left of Kathy Maxwell in that photo is Peter Zika. And Peter is also uh, extraordinarily knowledgeable in that flora and um, has done a lot of field work there. And he too has inspired my interest in learning about the flora down there and, and collecting in that area. Um, as I say, I've had a chance to go to the lower Columbia on several occasions. Sometimes the weather's been great and other times it hasn't been so great. Um, on the left is a trip that we took, I think it was in 2005. It's Ben Legler and Peter Zika and Kathy Maxwell and I are in the, in the uh, canoe behind that. We're out in Grays Bay. Just a wonderful place to paddle around. Um, that picture on the right, that's actually Kathy Maxwell. We're out in the middle of the Columbia River in September. Uh, it's kind of hard to see the horizontal rain in that photo. Uh, but, you know, it's not, it, it can be a really harsh place uh, to get out and about. And we were fortunate on this trip to actually have boat support from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So they want their high powered boats to take us out there. And that's the only way you're going to get around the Columbia River um, uh, under those weather conditions. Okay, so um, I've broken the talk into three parts. Um, I just want to give some background about what we define the Lower Columbia River in general, what I define it for this talk, and, and just some of the um, natural history of that area. And then I'll talk about it, both um, native species that I think are quite interesting as well as some uh, non-native ones. And so as I mentioned, there'll be a chance for questions after this first section and then after the section for the native species and of course at the end of the talk I'll gladly entertain any questions uh, that people have. Okay, so we think of the lower Columbia River um, as a riverine estuary habitat and the easiest way to think about that is essentially it's where the river meets the sea and there are a few uh, dramatic, as dramatic places in North America um, for where a river meets the sea as the Columbia. Um, the volume of water that comes down the Columbia River is uh, massive. And so that creates um, interesting tides and currents uh, and all kinds of other phenomena around that lower Columbia River area. And some, it, one of the byproducts of all that are some very rich, uh, very productive wetland and floodplain areas. Um, Interestingly, uh, there are tidal fluctuations in the Columbia River that go all the way up to the Bonneville Dam, which is, a, they, the measurement's about 250 river kilometers. So if you multiply, it's about 130, 140 river miles that that tidal surge uh, goes. And I'll talk a bit about that tidal surge. But um, why the Bonneville Dam? Well, I, you know, I, one in preparing for this talk, um, I didn't know that Bonneville Dam was constructed at a place which was called Cascade Rapids that was formed when a part of Table Mountain, not the one in Ellensburg, the one along the Columbia River, slid off in 1450 and created about a 500 foot dam. Um, the water backed up for 100 miles, ultimately broke through that dam, um, but the rapids remained. And those rapids were about 40 feet high when uh, Lewis and Clark came down the Columbia River. 
And so the tidal surge is not 40 feet. So those rapids effectively have been historically as far inland as that tidal fluctuation has go. Um, what's interesting about the tidal fluctuations in the lower Columbia River um, is that they are not brackish. Most of those uh, wetland areas along the lower Columbia River are freshwater wetlands and that really has a dramatic impact on plant diversity because most plants can't tolerate salt. Um, salt water is heavier than fresh water so when the tide comes in it actually goes underneath um, the water coming down the Columbia. And that's in part because there's so much water coming down the Columbia. If you, I'm from the East Coast, there's a lot of brackish uh, wetlands along the Atlantic coast because uh, the rivers there don't have that much power behind them. And so you get a lot of saltwater intrusion. Um, so these freshwater intertidal wetlands are really an unusual habitat here in Washington. The other, other places I'm really familiar with it is on the Chehalis River. Um, and it, for whatever reason, selects for an interesting assortment of plants. So I keep talking about the lower Columbia River estuary. This is a map that really shows um, that area. Here's the Bonneville Dam. So technically the lower Columbia River uh, as geomorphologists, hydrologists, and other people categorize it, is everything from the Bonneville River, uh, Bonneville Dam south. Here is uh, Portland down here. Um, it comes north and then heads out. And over here is Iwako and um, Cape Disappointment. And so we, and you know, if we take it, go out even further, um, the Columbia River Basin is divided into eastern and western subbasins, and effectively those two basins are divided by the Cascades. For my talk today and my field work that I've done in this area, I'm going to define the Lower Columbia River as essentially from Longview to the mouth of the Columbia. And the reason I choose Longview is because. Um, this section between Portland and Longview is really industrialized and that industrialization has impacted the flora there pretty significantly. Um, you see it as you're going along I-5. Uh, Kalama, you know, it's a huge port area and so, and then there used to, uh, historically there was a lot of um, boat traffic into Portland, and there's a lot of um, ballast that got dumped there. So let's, for today's talk, talk about from Longview out to the mouth of the river. And, you know, there's these some really large uh, islands in the middle of the river, and there's a bunch of braided uh, wetlands, and then there's some smaller islands out in the middle, and I've just put a box around those. Um, just to illustrate the fact that, you know, the lower Columbia is really a mix of man-made and natural variation. Um, the natural variation obviously is the weather, uh, the, you know, the geology, the water coming down the Columbia, but the man-made side of it is not trivial. That water coming down the Columbia is managed by a set of dams. Um, and so it's not a free flowing river by any measures. And then some of those islands are actually just giant dredge spills. And one such is this one here that was inside of that box, Miller Sands. I'll show you a picture of it here in a minute. Um, but these look natural, but um, you know, they dredge the Columbia River Channel regularly because it's such an important waterway uh, for commercial traffic. So it's important to remember that there's really that dynamic that's playing there. And you see some of these braided and, and more natural wetlands here on the south end of that photo. Um, and here's a picture of us on one of the trips. That's Kathy Maxwell over here. Uh, that's me, Kathleen Sace, and this was a biologist from the Fish and Wildlife Service. So those dredge spoiled uh, islands and mounds um, are huge. I mean, obviously you can't, this is dredge spoils. This is just pulled out of the bottom of the river, stacked up in these 40 and 50 foot tall sand dunes. Um, it's really quite impressive. 
Okay, so there has been a rich history of plant collecting uh, along that stretch of the lower Columbia River, dating from the late 1800s up until, you know, a year or two ago. And so I just went to the consortium database and did a search for all the plants that have been collected along that stretch of the river. And as you can see, um, it's been pretty thoroughly sampled. So we have a really good idea of what's there. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll sh share some of those findings with you. Okay, so before I go into the plants, um, I just wanted to see if there were any questions about any of um, that material I just covered. And uh, I'll defer to Denise to pass along any questions that came up. I don't see any questions yet, but it's a good time to ask one if you've got questions. And here's one. Do the dredge fields have more non-native species? Yes. Yeah, there's, you know, it turns out on those dredge spoils, um, you would, um, you know, they're often non-native grasses. Um, and, you know, they, those dredge, because those mounds are so high, they are not inundated. Uh, the way that the floodplains and the wetlands are. And so sandy soils that really dry out in the middle of the summer um, tend to select for a pretty narrow suite of species. Usually they're really weedy things, things that are either strongly rhizominous, like some of the non-native grasses. Native grasses are rhizominous as well, but some of the non-natives are particularly so. And then some of the aggressive annuals. Thank you. That question was from Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. And the next question, what is the difference in the color of the dots on the consortium map of collections? Oh, great question. Um, the gray uh, dots are dots that the geocoordinates for some reason are off. So um, basically, there is some, I'm getting an unstable sign. Um, basically, they, there's uh, some code running in the background that registers the dot and compares it to the metadata associated with that dot. And it reads that there is some kind of inconsistency. So it's just highlighting that this probably is not where this thing is supposed to be plotted. And I'm not pointing any fingers. Um, I'm not, I'm not um, furthering any rivalries between the University of Washington and Washington State. But when Washington State uh, was digitizing their collections, they had a mix up with the geocoordinate data. So oftentimes, not always, those gray dots are, um, resulted from some of the problems they had at Washington State. But yeah, it could be that some of those dots are uh, suspect. They, they should be somewhere else. Great question. So David Berger is asking, what about the other high volume rivers, for example, the Sacramento or the Fraser, regarding salt freshwater mixing? That's a great question. And I'm gonna show a slide a little bit. The Sacramento River, I'm less familiar with. The Fraser River is definitely on par with the Columbia River. Um, and I don't mean to um, overlook our, our Canadian neighbors. Um, I have only driven along the Fraser River as part of my um, recreational activities, but absolutely the same dynamic, a huge amount of water coming down and there is uh, really some interesting plant diversity. There's more development in the Fraser River um, corridor. Uh, there's a lot more agricultural development. Uh, so I think because the, the, the delta there is longer and, and shallower. Um, but yeah, same dynamic, the, the rich diversity of, of plants at the mouth of the Fraser. As I say, the Sacramento, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with it all, but I know they've done a lot of restoration work and it's also an area of conservation priority. Yeah, great, great questions. Um, okay, oh, I should, one last thing while we're here. Those large orange rectangles, 
Um, those indicate that there is a rare plant locality in that area, and we, you know, we cloud the exact localities of rare plants, um, and so that's what those orange bars are. There are a number of rare plant species in the lower Columbia, and we'll cover a couple of them today. All right, so interesting native species. And, you know, I should say interesting. They're interesting to me. I mean, I think they, you know, I think all, all plants have their intrinsic uh, value and, and interest. But I have to say, um, one area I have focused on over uh, my time in the herbarium is uh, the aquatic plant flora, because when I started working in the herbarium, there, the aquatic flora was really poorly documented and its distribution and diversity poorly understood. And together with Peter Zika and Ben Legler and Jeff Walker and some other folks, really we've emphasized, and Kathy Maxwell and, and, and Kathleen Hayes, um, you know, we've really, Jennifer Parsons with Department of Ecology have really improved our knowledge of um, the aquatic flora. So I have a particular fondness for aquatic plants. These are not things that are gonna show up in your wildflower books and then wildflower posters and other things, but they're just remarkably interesting plants. And um, I feel like this is a great opportunity to highlight some uh, overlooked elements of our flora. Okay, core sperm. And I'm gonna mention what you will, so what I've done is I've the scientific name, common name, and family. And I think what you'll find is that there's a lot of family level diversity. And I didn't go out of my way to select different plant families. I just say, I, I just narrowed down the plants that I thought were pretty cool. And um, there's a number of families here that uh, probably uh, that, that might be new to you, or certainly you don't know, know a lot of plants from these families. And amaranth may be one of them. It's the kenopods. It's the same family as um, um, kale, yeah, and spinach. And so um, Corospermum pacificum, Pacific bug seed, um, you know, the Corospermum taxonomically is just a mess. And uh, some of the Corospermum in our flora have only been collected two or three times ever. And there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done in Corospermum. And it turns out that Corospermum pacificum uh, has only a handful of locations in Washington and actually in Western North America and some of them are along the Columbia River and actually you can see this is you know this is some of the sandy shoreline here uh, not particularly showy they're wind pollinated so they don't have petals they have real tiny seeds uh, they're annuals or, or, or biennials they tend to flower really late in the year like September um, October is a great time to go down because the only way you can identify them was, is when they're in fruit um, and so this is the entire distribution of Corospermum pacificum. This is a map from the floor of North America. And you th it looks like, oh, well, it's in three states. It's got to be pretty widespread. That's it. Um, when that map was generated, um, the specimens, the plants from uh, British Columbia had not been collected. And so to David's question, for those of you who are familiar this is the um, this is the Fraser River Delta area and so Corospermum occurs up there most of the populations of Corospermum pacificum are known from the Columbia River and most of them from the lower Columbia there's a smattering of them out here and in case you're wondering why that is this is the Snake River so really all of the populations of Corospermum pacificum are on um, most of them are on the Columbia Snake and Fraser River. So um, particularly narrow distribution, hard group taxonomically. I'm pretty sure the Corospermum pacificum is on the Natural Heritage Program's list. Very narrow distribution, very, very few population locations. Okay, um, this is an interesting story. Um, this is Baccarus pilularis, and anybody from California like, whoa, uh, wow, why would that why would that be of interest? It's super common down in California and Southern Oregon. Chaparral broom, obviously chaparral is a habitat in California, so it suggests where it's from. It's in the Asteraceae, which looking at it, we don't have too many Asteraceous shrubs. 
Um, but if you look at the flowers there, uh, again, I said these aren't going to be showy plants, and this is another one that lives up to that, uh, that standard. Um, this is the capitulum, so here's our involucre, and these are um, flowers that have gone past. Um, it's a shrub to about two meters tall, and there is one, and this is the distribution here in uh, the Northwest. Now you notice our um, our database doesn't have a whole lot of California specimens. So if we had, you'd see it goes all the way down the coast there. So it's west of the Cascades, restricted to the coast. And you'll see that this is actually um, Cape Disappointment, um, the state park there, Il Waco. And this is a population just west of Longview. So those represent the what we thought were the two northernmost populations uh, of this species. And, you know, as conservation biologists and botanists, we're always interested in populations at the extremes of the range because they tend to um, blink out or they could be places where novel uh, mutations occur and, and, and further lineage sorting or diversification can occur. Uh, from outside the core of the range. And so, um, you know, right down there by the jetty, you can find Bacchus pilularis growing. It's pretty cool. Um, Sarah Gage, who I'm sure many of you know, um, brought me a specimen that she collected, I think this past winter in the fall, from Maury Island, which is, you know, attached to Vashon Island. Um, so, how that populate, whether that's a natural population, I have no idea. So that's why I have an asterisk here that these um, populations here in the lower Columbia represent the northernmost population. It could be that that Maury Island one is native. We're going to do some other, uh, try to get out there this year and, and take a closer look at it. But anyway, Bacchus um, ends its distribution there at the, at the mouth, we think the natural distribution at the mouth of the Columbia River. Stachys Mexicana. Most of us are probably familiar with Stachys coolie, coolie's hedge nettle. Uh, it's not the only hedge nettle in our flora. This is probably one of the showiest plants that I'm going to uh, show you today. Um, it's in the Lamiaceae. Um, it grows along the lower Columbia and pretty much along the western uh, co the western counties along the coastline and up into the Puget Sound. Um, you know, it's got more sculpturing and some other differences compared to our Cooley's hedge nettle, but it grows in the uh, cool, moist forests um, along uh, the Columbia River. Um, growing on some open forested slopes right above the uh, Columbia near the town of Skamakaway, which is about halfway between Longview and the mouth is Sedalcia herdipes, bristly stem, checker mallow. It's in the mallow family. Again, uh, one of the more showy plants we're going to take a look at today. So there's just a couple of populations, and these represent the northernmost populations of this species. And so this is Skamakawe area here. Um, you can see that there's a dot here. Um, this represents a plant that actually looks like a hybrid between um, Sedalcia herdipes and Sedalcia campestris. There's a lot of hybridization within the checker mallows. And so once again, I, I have this asterisk here um, because the dot shows up here. I, I really think this is some kind of, um, as I say, hybrid thing. Sedalcia herdipes is much more common as you go further south in Oregon. I know for a fact that this plant is on Washington's um, rare plant list. So, um, you know, the Columbia River, Lower Columbia River serves as uh, an important population, sent, uh, population site for this species. And as I say, because it's the northernmost edge, um, it's of particular concern to conservation biologists. Okay, so another, um, showy plant that you'll find in the uh, wetlands areas and um, cool rocky areas along the lower Columbia is a thing called Samolus. Some of you might say Samolus. 
West, uh, the water pimpernel is the common name. It's in the Primulaceae. Um, and, you know, uh, it's got these big fleshy leaves. It's got these inflorescences that have an abundance of the five petal uh, white flowers. And they've got these really cool looking uh, round capsules. So it's a pretty neat plant, and it is an interesting one um, in terms of distribution. Um, the next closest populations of Samalus parviflora are in uh, Southern California. And then from there, it heads east across the southwest. Um, so how this ended up in the lower Columbia River is anybody's guess. Uh, we, it, it, we believe that it's native there. We don't have any reason to believe that it's not. It turns out that in our flora, we have a number of uh, disjunct species from California. And by disjunct, I mean that there's a sizable geographic distance between the core of, of species population and the peripheral population. So this distance down, this population down to California, there's no gene uh, flow, there's no gene exchange. Whatever's happening here is it's happening uh, within that population. Um, and so just a couple of other interesting ones that I've come across. Um, I've been revising treatments or species descriptions in the plants of Washington, you know, the image gallery. And there've been a number of plants that have come up from the San Juan Islands. Um, I think there's about five or six of them. Uh, Ranunculus occidentalis, I'm sorry, Ranunculus californica, the California buttercup being one of them. Um, there's a species of annual lupin that uh, also is disjunct from California up into the San Juan. So there's about four or five other species. So these disjunct things from California are interesting and it's pretty cool that um, one of them is down there on the lower Columbia River. Um, this is a strange one going back to uh, some of the less showy elements of our native flora. Um, milfoil is probably a name that you equate with one of our worst aquatic weeds, Eurasian milfoil. Um, and it truly is a terrible weed, it's not native. But there are a number of native milfoils. And one of them is Myriophyllum usuriensi. Usuriensi uh, suggests Far East Russia, which is where this species also occurs. Um, and, you know, I think Florence Kaplow, back in the late 90s, you may recall she was the rare plant botanist, those of you who've been around for a while, recall she was a rare plant botanist before Joe Arnett, before Joe was one for currently uh, Walt Furtick. But I believe she was the one who first found this, and I don't know how she found it. Um, down along one of the wildlife refuges on the lower Columbia River. So this is the habitat. You can see it's got tidal fluctuation here. There's a lot of salico uh, salicornia, pickerel weed in here. And then if you go for whatever reason, you should find yourself walking out into that tidal mudland and you look down, uh, you will find these little plants here. And if you look super close, that's the Myriophyllum usuriensi. And, you know, um, until recently, we thought that the lower Columbia River was the only place where these plants grew. Um, within the last month, the Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria has put up their um, specimen data on the consortium site, and that has really changed our understanding of the distribution of some several rare plants, um, this being one of them. So we used to uh, think that this was really the only population um, in the Northwest, but it turns out Frank Lomer, who is, um, lives in British Columbia, he's an outstanding amateur botanist. He's made about 10,000 collections in British Columbia. He's documenting the, the entire flora of British Columbia. He has spent a lot of time, again, on the Fraser River Delta area. And he has located several populations. All these dots you see here is the Fraser River, and all those collections are Frank's, as well as these that he's made out on Vancouver Island. 
I don't know what to make of these older collections. I think they're probably misidentified because Usuriensi is really um, only, um, you know, a, a, a coastal species as far as we know. So at the very least, even though it's not the only population in the Pacific Northwest, these ones down here, the only populations, they by far are the southernmost populations and they're pretty distinct. Uh, I should, um, they're geographically isolated from these populations here. So once again, whatever is happen happening locally, genetically, environmentally within these populations is not getting spread elsewhere. And so again, these, these populations are of, of real conservation concern. Um, there are some really small plants that grow um, in the, in the basin there. And this is one of them, Crassula aquatica. It's related to sedum, water pygmy weed. Um, if you, you know, it'd be so easy to look past, but they do have flowers and they do have fruits. And it's pretty broadly distributed, uh, Crassula aquatica. But as you'll notice, it really occurs only along the Pacific Northwest major river. Here's the Columbia, here's the Fraser, more again here along the Columbia River. Um, another uh, plant that's of interest, Triglocan psalloides. It used to be in the genus Lilea. It's in the Juncaginaceae. Not a whole lot of things in our flora in that family. Flowering quillwort, really diminutive, wind pollinated flowers, small fruits, grows in uh, the uh, intertidal, freshwater intertidal zone. Um, pretty neat. And as you see here, again, it, it grows in the lower Columbia, lower Fraser, and then here in the Puget Trough. Uh, and then there's some inland populations. It turns out some of these saltwater loving plants also occur in uh, alkaline areas in the interior. Limacella aquatica, very common aquatic plant, grows in muddy areas. It's in the Scrofulariaceae. All those things got moved out of Scrofulariaceae. Um, this one didn't. So this is a true scroff. Uh, they're annuals, uh, short-lived perennials. They have these teeny little flowers that grow at the base of the plant. Uh, they tend to grow in large numbers. Pretty neat thing. You'll see it all along the Columbia River. And then there's a, 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 a closer look at it. And then the last one um, of the natives I wanted to cover was Liliopsis occidentalis, a member of the APAC. Who would think that this thing belongs in the APAC? But if you can see, the flowers are in umbels. And if we looked at those flowers, you see that there's five petals. There's uh, an inferior ovary, and if the fruits are little schizocarps. So everything that defines APAC you can find here. But this is a really cool plant. It grows in muddy areas, and again, it, it grows only along major riverways, along saltwater um, habitats, uh, mud flats like in the Puget Sound, and once again, the lower um, Fraser River, and then along the coast going south. Oh, this was the last one. Um, Poaceae, kind of a strange grass, Pespalum disticum. It's called knotgrass. It's a C4 grass, warm, uh, warm uh, season grass, flowers late. It's got these crazy horn-shaped inflorescences. Those are stigmas that you see. Um, and it too only grows along uh, major riverways. Here's the Columbia River. This is the Snake River going down here. And this is the Willamette River um, here down in, um, in Oregon. Okay, so I'll stop there and ask, see if there are any questions before we move on uh, to the last section of my talk, which is some of the interesting non-natives. I could ask a question that Alfredo Arano has asked. Are non-native plants on the island managed? No. Um, there is, there is, now, there, if there were noxious weeds that were found on some of those islands, I'm sure that they would control them, um, but there isn't outside of those, you know, the ownership of those dredge spoils, I believe is U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And based on my experience of going down there, they're really just managing for fish and wildlife. Um, okay. Deer, um, you know, there's a lot of management of um, birds on those islands because the terns and the cormorants eat salmon and that becomes, people really concerned about salmon runs. But 
plant control down there is really not very high on the people's radar. And any other questions, folks, before we move on? Here's a question from Fela Schwartz. Could the disjunct populations of Samolas par parp of Flores in Southern California and Lower Columbia be a relic of the days when coast, re coast redwood grew up and down the Pacific? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And, and I have to say, you know, encountering these disjunctions from California has really made me want to read and become more familiar with um, the paleo climates and try to figure out um, maybe, you know, what, what was going on. You know, there was a hypsothermal 8,000 years ago, um, which impacted our flora, but, I, um, but certainly, you know, some of the older times, um, you know, it, it, it would, it's, it's a, certainly it's possible. And obviously that area wasn't glaciated, so it really leaves open the, op the chance that for a lot of explanations. Yeah, great question. Okay, so the last part is um, interesting, what I think are interesting non-native species. Um, and what makes them interesting in part is their, the distribution and in part is just um, things that I would not have any other reason to see these plants other than um, spending time down along the lower Columbia. And so this is one of them, uh, Merdania, Merdania Kisak, water removing, wart removing herb. I don't know if that, it lives up to its name. It's in the Comelanaceae, which we don't have anything in our flora native in the Comelanaceae. If you go to Eastern North America, um, you will find Tratoscantia. Some of you may grow Tratoscantia in your gardens. That's a native member um, of, uh, native to the East Coast. Um, um, Camelina or Comalina is a, a genus that sometimes shows up as a weed. But anyway, pretty cool plant. It's a monocot. You see the floral flowers are in three parts. Um, they've got these crazy uh, sheaths where the leaves attach. And then they've got these adventitious roots that are coming out of the nodes that allow it to you know, fall over and root in all kinds of places. And you can see, this is a plant that's just kind of floating on the water surface, but you can see these adventitious roots here coming out of the nodes. So um, pretty neat thing. And here is the distribution of it in North America. Um, again, you know, this is a map from the floor of North America. If something occurs in the state, they just color the whole state. Um, the only other place in North America where Merdania occurs, it's not native, it's from Asia, is here in the southeast. Um, and if we look at the um, distribution map here from the Pacific Northwest, the lower Columbia River is the only place. Uh, in Western North America where Merdania occurs. And within that area, it's only that area um, to the west of I-5. And, you know, it, it could, and, and I'll just offer this as an explanation for several of the plants that I'm going to mention here. Um, remember I said earlier that historically there was a lot of boat traffic that brought ballast into the Portland area. And it could be that some of these non-native um, species that have become established in the lower Columbia, you know, um, harken back to when they were introduced as, as ballast that was dropped off. I don't know, um, but you gotta admit that's um, kind of a long distance dispersal event or some uh, re crazy reason how that ended up there. Um, Baltonia asteroid, oops, that's a mistake. Um, it's really not, um, I, I, so I copied slides to keep the format the same and I changed the names. Usually, um, I forgot to change the name here. Baltonia, the common name is white doll's eyes and the family is Asteraceae. My, my apologies for the error. Um, some of you may grow 
uh, Baltonia asteroides in your garden. I'm uh, originally from the East Coast, and Baltonia asteroides is something that is native uh, back East. It's a late blooming member of the Asteraceae. It flowers in like August and September. Beautiful plant. It forms these large masses. Uh, and so you go out along the, the shorelines, the, the freshwater intertidal zone, and some of those uh, more late successional dredge spoils that's where you've got a shrub layer and a well-developed um, perennial species layer, you will find Baltonia doing pretty well. And so here's the, the distribution of Baltonia in North America. Everything from the Great Plains East is native, and then everything um, out in our area here is introduced. And you see there's, there's a, a couple of populations, or one population down here in, um, along the Snake River, not quite sure. Um, that's not the Snake River. This is a, a lake somewhere in Northeastern Oregon. Uh, maybe somebody planted it there. Uh, this is the Willamette River. And then of course, lots of it down here on the lower Columbia. This could be a, a you know, one of those things that came in with ballast on a boat that came from the East Coast. A pretty neat thing and not something you're gonna see anywhere else uh, here in Washington. Uh, this is a crazy plant. If any of you uh, are aquarium enthusiasts, uh, you might be familiar with this, a frog bit. It's in the Hydrocaritaceae. Again, we don't have a whole lot of members in that family in our flora. Um, Limnobium levigatum. And Peter Zika, who took this photo, collected this for the first time about three years ago, down on a, in a waterway, a slough area, down um, near Ilwaco. And not, so it's got these crazy inflated leaves that you can't see. They're kind of spongy, a lot of aranchyma in the middle. Um, they've got these very strange flowers and these very strange fruits that uh, grow at the, at the bottom of the plant. But perhaps its most pernicious aspect of it for us, I mean, botanically it's an interesting plant, is that um, it spreads vegetatively. It pops off new plants. Uh, it can take over entire waterways like this one down in southwestern Washington. So it's a cool plant. It's interesting, but it really has the potential to become a problem um, in some of our uh, native waterways. Now, this is probably, I don't know the exact location, but you probably know, you may or may not know, there's a lot of cranberry cultivation down in southwestern Washington. I'll touch upon that in a second. So frog bit, pretty neat. It's the only population of this species in Western North America. Um, I don't think I've got a, no. Um, the only other places where you find this, again, are south in, in, in um, North America, is the southeastern US where it's also introduced. Again, I believe this is a tropical, uh, I believe it's native to the West Indies and uh, Central and South America. So um, I'm guessing somebody had it in an aquarium. Uh, maybe they dumped their aquarium plants or something. I have no idea, but uh, that's the only place in Western North America where um, limnobium occurs. Okay, so Cyperaceae, triangular club rush, Shonaplectus triqueter. Some of you might. Uh, recall, or maybe aren't aware that Shunaplectus is a genus that was split out of Scirpus, the bulrushes. Um, and so Schunaplectus triqueter is a, the triangular club rush. And these photos here, this photo here show you, shows you why it gets that name. These very sharply triangular stems. Um, and it grows, it's Strongly rhizomatous. Uh, this is from the Grays Bay area. Uh, we, uh, and so you can see everything here is um, Sunoplectus triqueter. So it's rhizomatous, tolerates uh, standing water, and then can go up to um, really just the wetland edge there. So pretty neat looking thing. Um, Mimulus. Now, 
some of you probably know that the genus Mimulus got split up. Um, most of, all of our native um, monkey flowers are in the genus Erythranthi or Diplicus or Mimitanthi, but the genus Mimulus still exists. There's two species in North America. One of them is this one, Mimulus ringens, the square stem monkey flower. Um, it's blue and it's got square stems, as, as, as the name implies. So not all square stemmed opposite leaf plants with bilabia corallas are members of the mint family. Um, that's for another conversation, but this is in the Phrymaceae, got split out of Scrofulariaceae. And this too is another East Coast native. So this is something I was familiar with uh, back East. It's a beautiful plant. Um, it grows in uh, wetlands, mucky soil, tolerates standing uh, water, and uh, pretty neat looking thing. And oops, I don't, it, so um, I thought I had a distribution map of it, but it turns out that it doesn't, it's not restricted to only the Columbia, lower Columbia. I've collected it up near uh, McNary Dam. It's been collected up by the, the Tri-Cities area. So it is something that grows all along the Columbia River, but it's something that you will find in an abundance in the lower Columbia. And so the last plant I have is another East Coast native, Peltandra virginica, the Arrow Arum. Um, it's in the Aeraceae, Aeraceae, um, a chorus, a uh, sweet flag, um, the lemnas, the duckweeds are in Aeraceae, um, and so is uh, Peltandra vir virginica. And so it grows in standing water, super common plant on the East Coast in wetland areas. And um, it's got a, like Jack in the Pulpit, it's, and Aracy, um, skunk cabbage, Lysichitin is in that family. It has a spathe and spadix inflorescence and um, is found, it's native in the Eastern half of North America. And then these are the only two locations where it grows in Western North America. Again, uh, up here, it was been collected up in the Bellingham area and then down here on the lower Columbia, actually on the Oregon side. Hasn't technically been collected on the Washington side of the Columbia River, but it does occur in Washington up in Bellingham. Okay, so that's, those are all the plants that I had to cover. And I just want to summarize. Um, the lower Columbia is a really dynamic environment and those, you know, those, that's, those sources of dynamism are both natural and man-made. Uh, that water, the amount of water coming down uh, the river is huge. The amount of siltation, sand, um, all of that adds up to creating an environment that supports a rich diversity of life, um, plant life. Um, it really does important, uh, harbor some important state, regional, and continental plant diversity in the lower Columbia. So, you know, it is an area of um, intense commercialization through ship traffic, through boat fishing, recreational boating, but really there's some important native plants uh, that are rare that live in that area and need, needs to, they need to be continue to be prior, prioritized and protected. And, you know, for a small area, it does harbor a high diversity of non-native species that are uncommon elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest. So it's kind of cool in that regard. So in terms of acknowledgements, again, I want to say thank you to Kathy Maxwell and Kathleen, uh, I shouldn't say Stace, it should say Sace. I'm sorry, Kathleen, Stace is, a, is another botanist. And Charlie Stensvall is a fish and wildlife source biologist who supported a lot of our um, trips out onto the Columbia River. Um, all of the photographers, all those images, or 98% of them came from the image gallery. So thank you, Ben and Jerry Carr um, and a whole host of other photographers. Uh, I got the, as I say, from the image gallery and then Friends of the Herbarium supports my field work and supports the image gallery development. So thank them as well. And I'll end there. I, my clock says it's 4.55. So we have time for a few more questions. Thanks. Thank you, David. We're waiting for questions. Alfredo says, thank you. Caitlin says, thank you. Fascinating. More questions?
more questions? Helen McCall says, very interesting on an area I'm not familiar with. It's a fun place to visit, Helen. Sarah Hammond says, thank you, super interesting. Yeah, and so just in terms of access, I want, you know, um, Cape Disappointment State Park, um, uh, you know, you, you can get down to the waterway along there. And of course, there's a highway that runs along parts of it from um, west, like Skamakaway, Grays Harbor. Um, so you can get down along the river uh, in, in some of those places. And the Fish and Wildlife Refuge itself, you can get out onto, so. And Shelly Scudery asks, are there any specific plant guides for the area? No, not that I'm aware of. Yep. No, it'd be nice. Um, well, let me, let me take a step back. Kathy Maxwell did a um, occasional paper on the lower Columbia River and the Willapa Hills. And so, I, Denise, is that paper sold out? Actually, we only have a couple of hard copies here. However, our occasional papers will be made electronic and available in the near, not immediate future, but soon. And Kathy has also done updates to the plant lists and some other parts of that paper, which she's provided for me so we can update it. Yeah, so that, that is the definitive uh, resource on the lower Columbia River flora is, is Kathy's um, book. And, and as I say, so much of our knowledge of, of what occurs there is based on her extensive field work. So uh, by all, yeah, definitely try to get a hold of that. And you can find out more about the occasional papers of WNPS in the publications section um, in our um, editorial component of the website. Uh, Shelly Evans says, I'm curious as to why you don't consider the possibility of the California disjuncts being introduced by the earlier explorers traveling by ship or more current boat traffic? It's certainly possible. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, the disjuncts in the lower Columbia and the ones in the San Juans, um, you know, it's, it's, one can't make a decision native or introduced with any great deal of confidence. Um, it could be that they're all introduced in some way or another. Um, I don't know if somebody just had a, a fancy for wildflowers and thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to see the California wildflowers up here in the Northwest? Um, it's a, it's a great question. And it's not one that I'm particularly, you know, uh, I feel like I, I'm not a rare plant biologist. Um, I'm interested in it and my work supports it, but I would say that the reason why these things are considered native is to err on the side of caution and that um, disjunction until proven otherwise or with clear evidence should be considered native. Uh, rather than making a mistake that, oh, find out later for some reason, oh, these were native and sorry, um, we should have done a better job protecting them. But great question. Yeah, the Samalus, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Um, could be introduced, no doubt, given the history of other just crazy uh, disjunctions in the lower Columbia and, and the amount of traf boat traffic, people around there, yeah. Great question. And Shelley follows up with, there are a lot of blank areas on the map between the Columbia and the Fraser. How much of a search has been done for these species in those areas? You know, um, I have to, I've, I've um, every year I make at least one uh, aquatic plant trip. And most of the plants we talked about are aquatic. Um, I'm one person. And so, you know, it, it, it takes a long time to cover those areas. 
I, I will say that, you know, and Peter Zika has done a lot of work along the coast as well. Some of the issues um, are, uh, there's a lot of degraded habitat now uh, along in that stretch between the lower Columbia and um, the lower Fraser. That the lower Chehalis, you know, that's Hoquiam and that's heavily impacted. The Willapa River, um, you know, it's tough getting access around there because a lot of that is um, timberland and paper mills and stuff. Um, some of it is just private, so access is an issue. Man, it would be wonderful to do a whole lot of, you know, to, to do field work in the Willapa Bay, um, the, more in the Chehalis. I've done a fair bit of work in the lower Chehalis, so some of those distribution um, information is, is reflected there in some of the aquatics, but yeah, it would be nice. I'm, I'm less convinced in the, in the north, in the Puget Trough area, because that's a completely different system. It's really um, salt, you know, it's mostly salt water and the rivers that flow in there are, are low gradient at that point. So I don't, so yeah, it's slightly different, but yeah, there could be places along there. Yeah, great question. Thank you. And Phyllis Schwartz says, thank you for a very interesting talk. What about Eastern U.S. plants coming in with oysters? Yeah. Oh, so thank, yeah, thank you so much for raising that issue. I don't think they came in with oysters, but I do think a lot of them have, I, I know a lot of uh, weeds down in southwestern, I should say we non-native species in southwestern Washington have come in with uh, cranberry cultivation there's a rich assemblage of East Coast natives that are in that um, Long Beach Peninsula area, uh, the lower um, uh, Willapa Bay, uh, Nacelle River, that whole, that whole area. Um, yeah, they came in, I, I think it's more, more likely they came in with cranberry cultivation than oysters, but certainly some of the salt marsh things probably came in with oysters as well, yeah. For sure. Most of those things that I talked about today um, were not salt water plants, so I think it's less likely that they came in with uh, oysters. But yeah, great, great question, great comment. Julia Bent asks, is it possible to kayak out to these areas? Uh, you know, uh, yes, if the weather is favorable, um, but Anybody who spent any time on the Columbia knows that um, there's a, a pretty rich history of recreational boaters, windsurfers, um, in getting injured or dying uh, out in the open water. I mean, yeah, it's a dangerous place. I, the closer islands, for sure, but the ones that we went to, like Miller Sands, that was a real haul on a on a pretty rough. I mean, on a, on a very sturdy boat with probably, you know, two 250 horsepower motors. So I don't think you want to do go out to those ones in the middle without a way back powered. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Thank you. And Don Harden asks about plant lists. Are there plant lists for the lower Columbia? And I'll just mention, I didn't look on the WMPS plant list map and there are three listed uh, including uh, Cape Disappointment, uh, Chinook Point, and this third one is Columbia Coast. Huh, cool. County. And it lists 1,015 species. That sounds Columbia County? This says Columbia Coast, Pacific County. Oh, okay. Yeah, that probably includes all of the Long Beach Peninsula. But Chinook Point, that would be a good one. And so, so would um, Cape Disappointment. I mean, there's a lot of forests um, in Cape Disappointment. So there's going to be, you know, a lot of upland things. But yeah, you know, where the boat ramp is on the backside of um, the jetty there, uh, there's a lot of wetland area and... Yeah, you can just poke, you know, poke around and find places to pull off along the highway and walk along the shoreline there. 
um, you'll definitely see some, <laughs> see some interesting things. I have been all along the Columbia River from the mouth all the way up to Kettle Falls and it never ceases to amaze. It's definitely a place it, always worth stopping and taking a look at. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your great questions. Thanks for your interest. And um, feel free to email me if you have any other questions. Very good. Thank you very much, David. Yeah. Thank you, Denise. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful. And um, I will sign off. Very good. Good afternoon, everyone. Enjoy this beautiful weekend here in Washington. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk about a recording potentially posted next week. Thank you.